Well, thank you so much. It was a very nice time uh, being back again here in Dhaka. Uh, yesterday also we have a very beautiful sessions. So my topic today is a clinical evaluation. But what do we mean a clinical evaluation? So the clinical evaluation follows a lot of things from history taking to a dialysis. So it is a complete package. It is not okay one thing that we do. But why we need a clinical evaluation after history taking is what? phenotyping our patient because we should know what are the treatment that we are offering to that patient. So main objective of clinically examining the patient is to phenotype our patient. So, so because one size fit all doesn't exist nowadays, so it doesn't exist. So we have to understand. We cannot just bang a sleep tap in each and every patient and we cannot just bang sleep surgery in each and every patient. We have to understand it. So, now it is an era of the personalized medications. Now still we are in a phenotyping, but the future is a personalized, tailored medication to each and every individual. So treatment of these individuals may be quite different. So we cannot just bang surgery or we cannot just give a CPAP, these are all the individuals. So we have to phenotype all these things. So main objective of clinical evaluation is phenotyping. So we should know what who are the person in the risk factor. So if the patient is always male, easy, and the Mongolian races, they are in much more risk factor in developing the sleep apnea than normal obese patient, female patient, young people, and non-Chinese girls. So the obesity is bombarding like anything. In the past, we were not that much obese because we used to go to jungle, we used to hunt our food, at least we used to go to a restaurant to have a food. But nowadays, because of all the foods have, the food is delivered in our home. So we don't even walk. So the obesity is coming like anything. So this is one of the most important factors in our part of the world contributing to the sleep apnea. So we should think while we clinically evaluate our patient. After that, after proper history taking, then we should do a sleep study. And we have a various type of sleep study. But what we do is that we can do a level one study or we can do a level two or three study. So this is a level one or two study is a level 3 study. But for me, level 3 study is more than enough in diagnosing a sleep apnea. But if my patient has the comorbidities or if my patient has a lot of the symptoms but level 3 study doesn't show sleep apnea, then I do offer a level 1 or level 2 study to, to my patient. Or if the patient is having comorbidities along with sleep apnea, then I do a level 1 or 2 study. Then after comes the upper airway evaluation. That is a prime, prime important because now we start to phenotype our patient. Sleep study also helps to phenotyping, but clinical evaluation also helps in the phenotyping of our patient. So we start with the nose. So if the patient is having gross septal deviation, nasal poly, obviously the patient will benefit from sleep surgery or nose surgery. But if we see there is an alar collapse out here and mild deviation of the septum, and we try to do a septoplasty, it doesn't work. In those cases, we have to do a nether valve suspension. So, every surgery doesn't fit in each and every individual. We have to understand that. So, the patient with nasal valve collapse will not benefit from septoplasty. So, they have to undergo a nether valve suspension. We have to understand that phenotype of the patient. Other is oropharyngeal. See, if there is a big tonsil, definitely this patient will be helped from a tonsil endomy. But if the tongue is very big and we are doing a tonsil endomy, maybe this patient will not be benefited from. We have to do something more for his time. We have to understand that. If we have to, if we are operating this patient, only giving tonsil to me to him, it may not help. So we have to do something for his uncle also. We have to understand this phenotype. Then afterwards, this time. If, the, if you see any person is having a lot of indentation in their tongue, that is a thick marking in the tongue, that we have to understand that. This tongue is very weak for his oval cavity and we have to do something for his tongue. Otherwise, septoplasty or simple tonsillectomy will not help in this group, in this group of the patient. Similarly, this malampati normally, if the patient is having BMI of 40 and malampati grade 4, the result of the surgery may not be that good as we expect. Okay? So in those cases, maybe we should offer them a SICA initially. So, we cannot ban that patient with the surgery because result may not be as expected. But if the patient cannot use a CPAP, then we can offer some sort of a surgery. It may help. But the AHI will not come down from 80 to 5. It will come down from 80 to 50. 
So we have to understand this. So yesterday we talked about that. If the patient has, is having grade 1 tonsil and severe sleep apnea, and the patient is having grade three ton, grade 4 tonsils and severe sleep apnea, this patient will benefit from surgery. But this patient may not be benefited from simple tonsillectomy or palate surgery. We have to do something more to the patient. How we do it, we'll explain. So this patient will definitely be helped from tonsillectomy. This phenotype will definitely be helped from tonsillectomy. Then lateral pharyngeal wall grading. If the lateral pharyngeal wall is grade 4 and we are doing only the pharyngoplasty, simple pharyngoplasty, this patient will not be benefited. This patient may need an expansion of the pharynx naturally also. We have to understand that. Then, if the patient has a big uvula, thick uvula, we have to do something. So for his uvula also, the simple concept will not have, separate plastic will not have. We have to do something for his uvula also. We have to think. <coughs> then, if the person is having this high house pattern, yesterday Dr. Kishore, he uh, is nicely told about dome surgery. So uh, simply doing a tonsillectomy, something in his tongue, it doesn't help this patient. He has to undergo dome. Then this patient, okay, this patient who is at the red-footed mandible, in this patient we do a tonsillectomy, some sort of tongue surgery, it will not happen. Either this patient will need a hypoposal of stimulation or this patient has to undergo MMA to get cured. So we have to understand these phenotypes. This patient, okay, this is at the red-footed maxilla, but see, rapid maxillary expansion, it won't help in this patient. We have to understand that. We have to do something more for his heart palate. Then after that comes the office endoscopy. But office endoscopy, it will help when to identify the static anatomical obstruction only. It will not take about the dynamic obstruction that is happening. But it will tell roughly something in his nose, something in his tonsil, something in his tongue, or in his larynx. But it will not tell dynamically, it will tell static stuff. Then afterwards, we can do some investigation, that is radiological investigation. But it is not commonly done in routine clinical practice. But if any patient is coming down to us and we think that he needs some skeletal surgery, then this is required. If the patient requires a skeletal surgery. Then we can dynamically also assess the patient by doing a MRI. That is in MRI. But that is not feasible in each and every center and it has also some drawback. But the best thing that we can do in our clinics is a Muller's manual. It is just doing a river valsala and scoping the patient. That will tell much more thing about the palate. But beyond the palate, it is not good. So tongue based epicrotis, it may not be good, but for a palate, it will roughly about 8 to 70 to 80 percent will poorly to the diet spine. So Muller's is good for palate, but not down below the palate. Then afterwards comes the sleep endoscopy. So slip endoscopy that we will be talking later on also, but see, this slip endoscopy will tell roughly a lot of the things. If there is a collapse at the level of the diagram, anteropostal collapse, lateral collapse, or circumferential collapse. And the need of the surgery may be different. This patient may need a different surgery, this patient may need a different surgery, and this patient may need a different surgery. Similarly, the tongue is for, in, uh, in the collapse, in the hypophyrins also, it will tell something, but so, in the tongue case also, it will tell you whether this is a muscular tongue or primary collapse, it will tell a lot of the things. So, we can tailor make our treatment individually. So, if this is a big muscular tongue, obstructing the pharynx, eh, the larynx posteriorly or airway posteriorly, and we are doing only something like a tonsillectomy or something like that, or liver tonsillectomy, it doesn't matter. This patient may need a hypoglossonomal stimulation too. Then afterward, when there is a problem in the epicrotis, so it is a, either it is a primary epicrotis or it is a secondary epicrotis or it always like this, so we have to understand. If it is a primary epicrotis, we have to do something in the epicrotis itself. But if it is secondary epicrotis, something, we can do something in the tongue, above that, to treat the epicrotis. So we have to understand this phenotype. Then afterwards, we have to record all the things. Because that patient may not come to a surgery immediately. That patient may come after two to three months. So we have to systematically record everything that is available from the spine. Similarly, in the child also. In the child also, we have to understand the findings. We all know years old findings of this child with the adrenal faces. Dull look, loss of nasal deviant fold, pinched nose, retracted lip, open mouth, and high aspirate. And after that, we 
When the child comes to us, then we do an office endoscopy and we see there is a big, 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 big animus back here and up. Then when he opens his mouth, then we can see the big tonsils out there. So he undergoes adrenal tonsillectomy. But we know the success rate of adrenal tonsillectomy is not more than 50%, especially in the child. So uh, there is something beyond the adrenal tonsillectomy also. So we should assess the child after the, after adrenal tonsillectomy if he still has a residual OAC then we have to assess it. But this is not a scope of, of this talk. But success rate of adrenal tonsillectomy in child is not great enough. So we have to understand that. So thank you so much. Uh, enjoy your organization.